announcements maybe. So first of all, good morning. <laughs> and I hope you had a good day yesterday. So you got a chance to see how our days will go. So the structure will be, I think, very similar throughout the two weeks. We have three lectures in the morning, and then we'll have these exercises. And it's really, really, for us, it's really key that you sit down and try to do whatever you can, because this is the best way to absorb. Otherwise, we keep telling you things, and they don't, you don't really learn if you don't try yourself. OK, and, uh, and we are here to help. Uh, one small comment, I think the tutorial session I don't know, I think yesterday it was wrong at some point on the schedule, it's at 2 p.m. So I think it was written 1.50, I'm not sure, maybe it wasn't, but. Okay, it starts at 2, and also I had some questions. So the room is booked from 2 to 4. On the schedule it's written, ah, this is wrong. Why coffee break, ah, maybe, ah, it's confusing. Is coffee break at 3.30? I thought coffee break is at 4. <laughs> okay, I don't know, this, no. at some point we will have uh, food. <laughs> Okay, there are two things to correct in the schedule. So first of all, the room is booked from 2 to 4. In reality, we wanted to put on the schedule from 2 to 3.30 because we don't want to force everybody to sit here for two hours. And so let's say from 2 to 3.30, we hope everybody will come and try. After 3.30, if you are tired, feel free to leave. Maybe some of us might leave too, but you, if you want to keep working and try solving your problems, you can stay until 4 to, to work. And I thought coffee break should be at 4 every day. And I think the other days it's at four, so I don't know if today I will check. At some point there will be coffee break. I think it should be at four. And today in the afternoon, we will have a socializing networking event uh, specifically for um, women and for uh, gender minorities, so and whoever self-identifies with women. And uh, again, uh, this will be, oh, there's also a typo, it's not on the Adriatico, I already asked for this to be corrected, but probably it will be corrected only uh, later. And it's also in the terrace, the same place where we had the, the socializing yesterday with the ice, breaking, ice breakers. We will have um, some small groups discussion. And again, it's like a networking socializing opportunity. And we also have some questions about uh, um, gender and mathematics and some, uh, discussions together. So I hope to see all the uh, women and gender minorities, people who, uh, later. Okay, so time to start with mathematics. And first I will give you the solution. I think most of you uh, saw, did it, but let me first uh, uh, complete uh, the theorem we were proving yesterday. So we saw uh, that if we have a rotation and it's the, the angle is rational, every orbit is periodic. But if the angle is irrational, then every orbit of the rotation is dense. So again, dense means for every, I pick any other point on the circle, and I pick an epsilon, and an epsilon neighborhood uh, is like an arc with size epsilon. And uh, dense just means that uh, at some point my orbit will fill Will, will enter this arc. And here I wrote, when I write distance, again, you can think of this distance as measuring the smallest arc length between the two points, okay? Maybe divided by two pi, so that the total distance, uh, the total circle is one. Okay, and we did uh, two steps. We showed, first of all, if the rotation number is irrational, then uh, the orbit never close up. So you never get two same points. And then we used pigeon hole principle to say that if I chop uh, my arc, my circle into capital N, ah, sorry, this is one or If I chop my circle into uh, capital N equal arcs, then, uh, and I look at N plus one points all distinct, automatically distinct, then I, I will find two points which fit in the same arc. And again, here I need to divide, my, my arc length has to be divided by two pi. So I want to say that the arc length between these two points falling in the same arc will be, uh, and this is RL. And this distance is less than one over n. And as many of you did, what do I have to do next? So the key observation is to, a remark that uh, uh, R alpha is an isometry. 
which means that if the distance between r alpha of z and r alpha of omega is the same than the distance between omega z and omega. This is obvious on the picture. So if I have two points and I rotate them, the distance is the same. So this implies, plus the fact that it's an isometry, implies that I can apply uh, R alpha to the minus k, if you want, which is also, it's invertible and it's also an isometry. And what I get is the distance between z and R alpha to the k minus L of z is also less than 1 over n. OK? And uh, uh, I'm assuming, for example, that k is greater than L. Otherwise, you can do the other way around. <coughs> so this tells me that R alpha to the k minus L is a rotation by a small angle. Small angle. And uh, I can choose, uh, and I can choose n uh, such that uh, 1 over n is less than epsilon. So now I have my point z. And if I move by these multiples of the rotation, if I move by the rotation of uh, k minus l, which is a subset of the rotation that I had before, I look at these points which I get when I apply power k minus l of my rotation. These points of the orbits will be very finely spaced because I move uh, by a small angle, are less than epsilon space. OK? So I move by a very small angle, less than epsilon. So it means that every time I apply this power of the rotation, I displace myself by some quantity which is less than epsilon. And that means that if I have a target window of size 2 epsilon, I'm bound to fall inside any uh, uh, 2 epsilon arc will be visited. And this is what I need to do for density. OK? <clears throat> OK. I think many of you got this yourself. So the main thing was to uh, use the rotation uh, isometry property. Uh, you can maybe see it differently if you want. Also explicitly writing the formula mod 1, you can see it. OK? So you can actually say more about an orbit of a rotation. Not only it will be dense in, uh, in 0, 1, but uh, I want to also state a theorem which was originally proved by Weil. And this tells you indeed that the orbit is also equidistributed. So for every alpha irrational, and again, irrational is key, for every alpha irrational and for every point of the circle, the orbit under the rotation of z is equidistributed. And now I will give you the definition. I, and let me say, I will tell you two properties and actually sketch the second. So I can pick an arc and try to understand on my circle how often pick an arc, and maybe I will write it on 0, 1 as an interval, a, b. So for every, let's say, interval a, b in 0, 1, Sometimes I switch between uh, multiplicative notation on the circle and additive notation on 0, 1. Uh, this is also 0, 1 with opposite uh, points identified. So if I, the, uh, if I start plotting my orbit and recording how many times I visit this arc, 
there is no reason why this arc should be visited more often than any other arc of the same length, because everything in the rotation is homogeneous. So, uh, indeed, if, if I look, I can count. So this is cardinality. If I can count how many times between 0 and n, how many k's between 0 and n are such that r alpha to the k of z belongs to uh, a, b. And I divide by n. The claim is that uh, this will actually tend to the length of the interval, OK? So in particular, it does not matter where my interval is placed. The uh, number of visits that uh, I, I have to this interval only uh, depends on the length. And actually, in the average number of visits, if I count how many times I visit, and renormalize by the total number of visits, this will tend to give me the length of the interval. So somehow this point is kind of approximating uh, the length as a measure. So this, I think, is a very intuitive sta statement, and this is a good way to think of this equidistribution. In general, you say that the sequence is equidistributed modulo 1 if this uh, statement is true. Have a sequence of points on the real line and take the mod one. If they satisfy this, I say that they're equidistributed in mod one. And more in general, it's actually you can have a stronger statement. So for every continuous function, function, and again, let me write it on uh, additive notation like this. For every continuous function from the circle to R, and for every, I, I will write X now. Uh, instead than z, I could have written x also there. For every continuous function, I can do the following. I can one over, take 1 over n, the sum of my function evaluated along the orbit of x. <clears throat> so I have a function defined on the interval, on the circle. And I sample my function at the values given by my orbit. And then this will uh, converge to the integral of the function. OK? <coughs> so a couple of remarks is that so we will see um, in the um, tutors' lectures you will see, if you haven't seen already, you will see ergodistic Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and you will see a similar result. But uh, uh, what is really cru crucial in this statement is that this is true for every point of uh, uh, the, the interval, and not almost every point. And another thing which is key is actually this, uh, in general, as a remark, this, uh, uh, the systems for which two holes, two is basically equivalent, in the sense, substitute the rotation with another map, uh, two is equivalent to unique ergodicity, which I will not define, but probably either Irene or Davide might define. So you keep this in mind for, if you already know it. OK? And I will just sketch uh, uh, first of all, you could try to uh, uh, two is not really uh, directly related to one. So if you could take as function the characteristic function of the interval a, b, you would immediately, the statement of two would give you this statement. But uh, in general, you cannot do directly this, but uh, you can try to convince that actually by some approximation argument, two implies one. So it's not obvious, but... Uh, Try to get convinced, especially if you haven't seen these things before. And uh, let me just give, me, give you a sketch of uh, how to show two. <clears throat> and this is, again, this nice argument due to Weil. And it also gives you a criterion known as Weil criterion for unique distribution. 
And the idea is to actually look at some special functions, so exponentials. So now I will use this uh, complex numbers. So let me call EM, EM of N, the exponential, e to the 2 pi i m. Ah, sorry, I need a bigger chunk. e to the 2 pi i m of x. So are you bothered by my m? Actually, my English, British students hate my m and n. So in Italy, this is n and this is m. And in the UK, this is n and this is m. So I guess my N always looks like an M, and my M looks like a strange wiggle with too many legs, but uh, okay, don't, don't bother. You can, I always try not to use M and, M and N when I teach. Uh, in the UK, I try to use K and L to avoid confusion, but okay, here I think we have only M, so if you write N, it doesn't matter. Okay, so, and uh, you want to look at this function, these exponentials, and, uh, and I want to prove, so the claim, is that uh, uh, two holes for functions which are these exponentials, for exponentials. And this is what I want to sketch. And let me assume also that m is not zero. And a remark, so what is the integral of this exponential? So the, remember, this exponential is nothing else than cosine. Um, no, sorry, there is no i. Uh, yeah. uh, no, there is i, sorry. Um, what am I doing? Mm. Uh, OK, this is, uh, no, there is an i, OK. Uh, Okay, so what I want, what I want to you integrate is the, say, absolute value of this. Okay. Uh, uh, for the absolute value. So, no, I'm saying something stupid. This absolute value is one. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, <laughs> so let me. Um, okay, maybe say, say that we want to prove it for cosine and sine, actually, for, uh, so think separately of real part and imaginary part. So we want to prove it for uh, uh, real part and imaginary part. OK, so for cosine and sine. OK, so the integral is uh, 0. So what we want to understand is what happens when I compute these uh, sums. So what happens if I compute these sums? If I compute these sums, so m of rk uh, uh, I think I'm making a mess. Uh, apologies, I think I'm making a mess. Um, what do I want to do? Uh, 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 what do I want to do? So I want to compute uh, I want to compute uh, what is the exponential of uh, uh, what do I want to do? Uh, I want to compute the exponential of um, uh, uh, oh, come on. Uh, so I want to look at the orbit of the rotations. I'm confusing myself between additive and multiplicative notation. So let me just say, uh, sorry, I, I made a mess between the two notations. So, so I want to compute it at, uh, uh, yeah, okay, r alpha to the k of x, let's say like this, which is just uh, x plus k alpha modulo one. Okay? And this is just e to the two pi i k uh, e to the two pi i m x plus alpha. <coughs> so it's just e to the two pi i uh, alpha times a m of x. Okay. Sorry, did I forget something? M. Did I forget something? 
EIA M alpha, is it? They forget this one? Huh? K, sorry. Uh, e to the, ah, K alpha, thank you. Yes, okay. So MX is here and MK alpha, yeah, okay. Thank you, I'm happy that you're all paying attention. E to the two pi I M, uh, e to the two pi I M K alpha times E M of X, okay? Is it correct? Okay. And this I want to think of as uh, some number elevated to, pi, it's some, like some lambda to the K where lambda is this complex number e to the two pi i uh, m alpha, okay? So it's this number power k. <coughs> so maybe we will go, uh, we will go here. So if I, I just want to say that if I compute this uh, sums that I still have in the statement, So if I compute one over n, the sum from k from zero to n minus one of E m of r alpha to the k of x, plugging what I just wrote over there, this actually becomes the sum from zero to n minus one, and this is lambda to the k, is this lambda that I wrote over there, times E m of x. So you see what you get here, and actually this, this I can take out of the sum. Um, and I just have this, uh, okay, no, maybe I saw that is something stupid again. So I need to take absolute value of everything. And uh, uh, um, okay, let me just uh, uh, take everything in absolute value. And then you want to use, uh, so what is this sum? So this sum is just a geometric sum. So you just get one minus lambda to the n divided by one minus lambda. <clears throat> and the key thing is that in absolute value, everything which is in this sum is actually, because it's a geometric sum, so you know this formula for the geometric sum, this is actually bounded by some constant. So all this quantity stays bounded, but you have in front an n, so as n goes to infinity, it actually goes to zero, okay? Okay, sorry, I messed up a little bit the notation, but okay, that's the sketch. And so what you get is actually for, F, for EM, for these exponentials, for the real part and imaginary part, if you want to think of them as complex function, actually you do have these uh, uh, two holes. So the conclusion is that two holes uh, and now uh, for, uh, say, real part, imaginary part of EM. And then what you want to say as to, at this point is to finish, that I will not do. So what you should check, check what happens for M is equal to zero. And then uh, once you have it for exponential, you can extend it to F continuous. And essentially you're just using uh, that continuous functions can be approximated uh, by trigonometric polynomials. Ah, actually, okay, maybe extending, okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe this I will leave, uh, leave to do. So this basically gives you a sketch of two, and once you have two, try to go from two to one, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, this I think concludes the first uh, uh, properties of a rotation. And uh, so we know irrational rotations have uh, dense orbits and the orbits are equidistributed in this uh, strong sense of vial. And as I said, this criterion of using exponentials uh, is actually can be used not only for orbits of the rotation, but if you take uh, some other sequence on the circle, uh, something called Vi criterion tells you 
indeed, the diff uh, these complex exponentials get equidistributed, then uh, you say that the sequence is equidistributed uh, modulo 1. So for the rotation, it just comes from this uh, small computation. In general, you have to prove it, but you only have to verify it for these special functions. Okay, so the next st uh, step, I want to, as I said, I want to kind of uh, review uh, Gauss map and continued fractions. So we will step out of the world uh, of uh, rotations and we will look at a related dynamical system. And this dynamical system is actually not uh, entropy zero. It's kind of more in the hyperbolic world of Hanna's course, but it is kind of, it will act for us as the zooming lens, as the uh, renormalization machine in order to study rotation. So we will have, now and tomorrow, we will have a break and jump to the Gauss map and uh, see how continued fractions relate to symbolic coding for the Gauss map. And then we will use the Gauss map as a renormalization machinery and relate the Gauss map back to the rotation. Okay? So break for a second, and uh, I promise Irene that I will define the Gauss map so that uh, she can give you an exercise on the Gauss map later. So I will first talk about the Gauss map, then uh, later continued fraction and the relation. So this Gauss map, it's a map of the unit interval from 0, 1 to 0, 1. And it's the following map, g of x, okay, is equal to 0 if x is equal to 0 that we have to consider separately. And otherwise, if x is uh, different than 0, it's equal to the fractional part of 1 over x, where this symbol that I'm using now, so maybe I will, well, okay, where, okay, let me write. Another way to write this uh, bracket is also 1 over x modulo 1. So, if you, this notation is commonly used, you can take a, po a real number x and write it as a fractional part. And we saw it already. We saw it also yesterday in Hannah's course, right? So this is the fractional part, which is the same than taking mod 1. And this is the integer part. So the smallest, largest inter integer, which is uh, less or equal to x. Okay? Okay, so let's plot the Gauss map. So you may say, okay, how do I plot? I'm sure many people have already seen it, but if you haven't seen the graph of the Gauss map, maybe it takes you a second to understand what this map is. So let's do it. Uh, so implicitly, this definition gives you a piecewise defined function. So how do I know what is a fractional part? Uh, of 1 over x. So first of all, I have to understand uh, what is the integer part of 1 over x. So the integer part of 1 over x can be uh, any number, can be 1, can be 2, it depends on how large, how small x is. The smaller x is, the larger is 1 over x, and the larger is the integer part. So when is the, for which x is the integer part equal to n? Well, exactly when uh, uh, 1 over x has to be greater than n, but strictly less than n plus 1, right? Because this is exactly when the integer part will be equal to n. Uh, but this is the same than saying that x uh, has to be less or equal than 1 over n, but greater than 1 over n plus 1. Okay, so if I am in this range, so maybe we will call uh, Pn, we will use it also later, we will call Pn this interval 1 over n plus 1, 1 over n. And we will write this as x belonging to Pn. Okay. Uh, and I think I still cannot do uh, my plot, so maybe I will finish my uh, so what happens, so if, uh, if x belongs to Pn, then Gauss of x 
is uh, 1 over x minus integer part of 1 over x will be equal to 1 over x minus n. And this is true for 1, 2, dot, 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 for every n. So you have basically countably many uh, branches. It's a piecewise defined map which countably many uh, possibilities. And so let me be, do a big graph. Again, I'm sure some people have seen this plot hundreds of times, but if you haven't, then... So I can plot one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, and so on. So this is my P1 interval. This is my P2 interval. This is my P3, and so on. And on the first interval, this is just 1 over x minus 1. You can check. You can plot it's 0 at 1. And it's, uh, okay, I know the answer, so I do the plot. So it's a piece of a hyperbola, which actually goes exactly from 1, uh, one at 1 half. Let's check at 1 half, it's 2 minus 1, which is 1. And 0 at 1, so if I plug 1, is 1 minus 1, which is 0. And similarly, if you plot, uh, so this is um, 1 over x minus 1. And on P2, between 1 third and 1 half, I have a very similar picture. I also go from uh, 1 to 0 with the decreasing hyperbola. And this is 1 over x minus 2, and so on. So this is countably many branches, each of which uh, are pieces of hyperbola, and each of which are Surjective. So if I call, say sometimes I can call Gn is the branch uh, G restricted to Pn, and this is a surjective. It's an invertible and a monotone. Okay. Okay. Maybe now I, I should have done this reality check later. Who had already, who had never seen the Gauss map? Almost nobody, so I could have, okay. I think I should have done this before I can spend time to draw the plot. Okay, so in any case now, uh, um, Irene has ensured that everybody can do her exercise, but. Um, uh, so I want to connect this uh, uh, map with uh, continued fractions. So many of you told me that they've seen continued fraction. Have you seen how the symbolic coding of the Gauss map is related to continued fraction entries? Who has seen symbolic coding of the Gauss map in relation with continued fraction? OK, so I'm still doing something worse. <laughs> OK. Uh, and remind me again, who had never seen continued fractions? OK, so I will just, uh, uh, just write for the just quickly write then. You can read more if you want. I can give you a reference or continue fraction. But let me recall you. Uh, so let me write what is a continued fraction. Continued fraction. And sorry, I miss my chalk. Continued fraction. So most of you have seen. So if I have a number x, and let's say that x is irrational. I can actually express it uniquely in an expression of this form. I can write it as a fraction 1 over a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 dot, 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 dot. OK? Uh, and this is unique or irrational. and. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you can actually also do it for rational. So if x is rational, so uh, there is a finite expression. So for x rational, you can do the same, but at some point your continued fraction will stop. Okay, and actually, if it's rational, you can try to say, in this case, it's not unique. And if you want, you can try to find what are the two continue? There will be two continue fraction expansions. You can try to explicitly write them. 
And by convention, we write an expression, ah, sorry, x in, and, and I, I, as I wrote it, it's only in 0, 1. Otherwise, you can put an integer in front. Sometimes people call a 0 the integer part, and then they start from a 1. Here, we actually, I will restrict to numbers in 0, 1, because those are the only ones we are working with. And then I start from a 0, because um, the coding is slightly nicer. OK, so this notation, I will just write. Uh, like this with these brackets, a1, a2, an, and if it's infinite, then you just put dots. Okay, so so the the, the claim is that the continuous fraction of x is actually related to the orbit of the Gauss map. And I think Hannah will spend more time on coding later, but uh, I just need to tell you what is. Uh, what, what do you mean by coding this map and what is the itinerary of this map? So I have this nice partition. I have this partition into the intervals uh, P1, P2, Pn. And these intervals are disjoint, how I define them. And uh, uh, so Pi intersected Pj is empty if i is different than j. And also their union. Uh, is actually 0, 1 with 0 out. So they kind of accumulate towards 0. So if I add uh, 0, this is a partition of 0, 1. So what I want to do is to iterate my Gauss map. So I look at the orbit under the Gauss map of x, of a point x, do my dynamical systems with Gauss. And I want to record at each stage in which uh, of these intervals my uh, iteration lands. So I take my map. If you want, I do the trick that Hannah told us yesterday. I draw the diagonal. I take a point. And then I go to my map, to the diagonal, to my map. I mean, I, I, I apply the map G. And as I move around, I look in which of these small intervals I land. Look and, and record, record the Pn, the intervals, the Pn, the Pn which are visited. So and maybe let me write it like this, definition. The itinerary, the itinerary, and I go, I'm going to call it AI, not by uh, AI from zero to infinity. The itinerary of this uh, orbit, this will be a sequence, is the sequence of integers. AI. Oh, by the way, sorry, I think if you have seen continuous fractions, you know this, but if you haven't seen it, I should, this, what I said makes no sense if I don't tell you what are these AI. So the AI are integers. So I should, positive, it's not negative. So AI greater than zero are integers in this expression, are natural numbers, and they are called entries of this continued fraction expansion. OK, so otherwise this is not true. You can write it in infinitely many ways if I don't put restrictions on AI. So yeah, this is, uh, yeah. So again, the few that haven't seen continuous fraction, I will, set, I will post some lecture notes, and I spend a little bit more time on them. But uh, okay, I, I already bored people going too slowly on the Gauss map, so I will not do more on continuous fractions. OK, so the itinerary. The itinerary is the sequence of integers AI such that so gi of x belongs to pai. So I look at gi, and I look at which pn it belongs to. And that I record. OK? So again, did it meditate for a second if you haven't seen it. But this is just telling you. So this means that. Uh, uh, Ice eat, okay, the ice iterate lands in PAI. So this I'm recording the, the each of these AI will be a 
number from 1 to n. And I'm assuming that I'm not hitting 0, which actually will be the case, but I will tell you later why. Uh, OK, let me assume that x is irrational in this definition. Otherwise, this is not well defined. And again, it's in 0, 1. And uh, I claim that you are not going to hit 0, so this will be well defined. And now, um, OK, now I can go here. And now the proposition or the key link is that, so again, x is irrational, okay, x is irrational, ai, okay, x is irrational with, with itinerary, itinerary with respect to Gauss uh, ai. Then this itinerary is really giving you the continued fraction expansion. So this is a0, a1, an. So I can recover my point as a continued fraction. It's actually not especially deep. It's just in some sense the Gauss map is really made in order to do that. But uh, it's a good point of view to think of uh, continued fraction as symbolic coding. This is what I mean when I say the continued fraction is the symbolic coding of the, the sequence of entries in the continued fractions are giving you the sequence which codes records where my orbit uh, lands and which branches of the Gauss map I will be using. And I think we did it in the wrong order because Hannah, you will do symbolic coding for doubling map in relation to binary expansion. So the same relation that there is between doubling map and binary coding, there is between continued fraction, Gauss map and continued fractions. Okay, maybe just uh, let's uh, check this. So the first, let's, let's remark again that by definition of itinerary, definition of itinerary, and by definition of uh, of uh, plus the definition of Pn, we have the following, that if I look at Gauss to the n, 1 over Gauss to the n of x, this is equal to uh, a n. Ah, sorry, did I say it right? Yes. So if you want, again, let me say it again. Uh, by definition of itinerary, g to the n of x belongs to p a n. This is the definition of itinerary. And if you remember what is p n, and uh, uh, what we said at the beginning, that uh, the integer part is equal to, uh, to something exactly when I belong to p of that thing. So is it this clear to everybody? or? Are you, did I skip to, is it okay? You want me to, oh? <coughs> okay, so GN belongs to PN. Maybe if you want, you can add an equivalence here. And this is just saying that, uh, uh, no, I don't think I can, yeah. The, the, here I'm also using the one over X belongs to, sorry, that X belongs to PN. This is what we did a uh, uh, little bit before. X belongs to Pn just means that integer part of 1 over X is equal to N. This is what I'm also using in this. Uh, okay, and then basically you just have to do it by induction. So again, I think I will leave you uh, uh, the details. But so, okay, let's just do first, let's do it for N is equal to 1. So for, in particular for N is equal to 1, we have that... Uh, Oh, n is equal to 0, is equal to 0. We have that a0 is the integer part of 1 over x. And uh, that means that g of x is equal to 1 over x min minus a0. And now you can solve, and you get that, solve for x. So x is 1 over a0 plus g of x. 
he always checked my calculations. I know, so I'll check with me that I did. So I bring a zero from the other side and then take one over, okay? And then I think you can kind of see how it will go. And so if you want, we can do one more step. And then if you continue for, so if you continue for n is equal to one, if you want, you have that, uh, uh, we have that integer part of one over g of x, again by the remark, is actually a one is equal to a one. And that means, again, that uh, g square of x, which is the fractional part of one over gx, is actually one over gx minus a one. And uh, what does this give me? Again, I have to uh, solve for g of x. g of x is, uh, hopefully it's one over uh, a one plus g squared. Let's check. So I bring a one from the other side and take one over, okay? And now this bit, if you plug it inside the previous bit, I'm not doing the proof by induction, I'm doing the first two steps, which I think are more educational for the first time. If I plug g of x inside this, you see what you get after two steps? You get one over a zero plus, and I have to plug g of x, so one over a one plus g squared of x, okay? So you see, you kind of start seeing that uh, basically the the orbit of the Gauss map iterates of the orbit and code the reminder you have to put if you truncate this continued fraction at finitely many stages, okay? So I think that the easy exercise for today will also be to, uh, do, do, I mean, I know it's not difficult, but do, just do the induction, finish the proof by induction, um, because that, just to work yourself through practicing this. So maybe complete. Complete the proof. Let's do the inductive step in general. And I'm almost out of time, but I have just a couple of minutes to uh, maybe tell you some uh, properties of this uh, link between continued fractions and... Uh, and uh, uh, so maybe I'll, I'll tell them as facts. So the facts that I'm not going to prove, but they are nice to know, is that actually, if you look at the orbit, so if you have the orbit of the Gauss map, you, you hit zero, so gn of x is equal to zero for some n. If and only if, if and only if, what? Yes, if and only if x is rational. So irrational numbers are, that's why if you assume irrational, I told you, you can be sure that you don't hit zero. And another fact, what are the periodic points of the Gauss map? Ah, maybe another more important fact before I tell you that. So if x has a certain continuous fraction, a0, a1, dot, 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 then what will be the continued fraction expansion of g of x? Huh? Yes, exactly, a1, a2. So the Gauss map acts as a shift. So G acts as a shift on the entry, as a shift. So it moves the entries by, it's really a shift in the sense of symbolic dynamics, actually. Uh, and then you can find out which points are periodic for the Gauss map. So which points are, how will periodic points for the Gauss map look like? Huh? Uh, what, how about, oh, sorry, 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 I, I, I went too fast. How about fixed points? If I have a fixed point for the Gauss map, so, so fixed points for the Gauss map, there are countably many fixed points because I intersect a diagonal uh, many times, and they basically have to have um, the same entries. So the, if you have a point which is a continuous function entries is k, 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 k. This will be fixed by the Gauss map. And for example, this is, this is exactly what the golden mean look like. So I, I think, I hope I say by, so for example, the golden mean 
has uh, 11111 by continuous. It's the simplest number from the point of view of continuous fraction. It has periodic entries given by one, and it's fixed by the Gauss map, which is immediate by this remark that the, end, the Gauss map shifts the entries. And the next one is the silver mean, which I don't remember. It was probably square root of two. And this is called silver mean and so on. And, and finally, if you uh, try to, uh, to see what are periodic points, I went too fast from f fixed points to periodic points, but periodic points are related to, uh, in general, to quadratic irrational. So quadratic irrationals, quadratic irrationals are, are um, numbers whose, uh, uh, um, which have this essentially this form, a square root of d plus b over c. Or here a, b, and c are integers, and d, a, b, c, and d are integers. So this indeed is the, 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 the the golden mean was an example, square root of 5 minus 1 over 2. And uh, quadratic irrationals, so x, uh, they are also solutions of a degree to a quadratic equation. Uh, so basically quadratic irrational, x is quadratic irrational if and only if it's a pre-periodic point. So pre-periodic. So pre-periodic means that g, uh, there exist an n such that uh, uh, there exist an n such that g n of x is uh, what am I saying? Uh, periodic? Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's just uh, uh, this map is not invertible, right? So no, there exists an n such that uh, g n of x is periodic. Let's say like this. Okay. Uh, okay, and I think I run already out of time. But for example, this implication, the whole, but you can actually try to prove uh, an easier case. So if you have uh, a periodic point, for example, of period two, try to prove, so try it for period two and then try to prove that if you have a periodic point, uh, X periodic, and if you want to try period two first and then do the general case, then it's quadratic irrational. So more in general, this pre-periodic just means that the entries will have some beginning, which is whatever, and then they will repeat periodically after some time. Okay? Okay, thanks. That's, that's uh, I'm done, yes. So.